right, in this lesson, we're going to discuss what we call Kirchhoff's Law. Now, this was a guy who, you know, did some amount of work as it regards to circuits, right? And what we're going to learn today is just a simple way of finding out information pertaining to circuits. Now, there are several things that you can do, you can find whenever you have a circuit. You can find the voltage, you can find the current, you can find the resistance. With Kirchhoff's law, it makes us be more able to can find different things in regards to a, cir a circuit. Now, he has two specific laws, right? And Kirchhoff's first law is governed by what we call conservation of charge. Follow me? And his second law is bounded by what we call conservation of energy. And if we think about conservation of energy, we know that energy cannot be created nor destroyed but converted from one form to another, that kind of thing, right? Or you can look at it from a standpoint that energy in is equal to energy out. As it regards to the conservation of charge, what this tells us that whatsoever charge you start out with in a circuit, at the end of the day, that's the that that that's the that's the you cannot get more charge than what you actually put in. So if you put in five charge, at the end of the day, you should really get back five charge. All right, you can't get six. You shouldn't get four. Right? You should get about the same amount. So we're going to look at them in details and you understand why we say that Kirchhoff law speaks to the, car, um, the conservation of charge and why we say that Kirchhoff's second law speaks to the conservation of energy. Let's run along. So here we have a circuit right here. Right? And obviously in this circuit we have a, an EMF right a single cell that has an internal resistance small r we have um two resistors right here that are in parallel with each other so r a is in parallel with r b i must let you know something when it comes on to kirchhoff's law you're going to realize that we're going to introduce certain terminologies and one terminology that you'll hear us talking about is loop, right? You'll hear us speak about junction, all right? Now, in this particular circuit, right, it's going to have two loops. And a loop is just any enclosed area in the circuit. So any area in the circuit that is enclosed, meaning that there is not a break, so if we compare this, let's imagine that there is a switch right here, right? This would not be an enclosed loop. This is an enclosed loop, enclosed loop. And then now this would be an open, open loop, all right? Quite often, Whenever we're talking about loop, there's going to be a direction in which the current is going to flow. You will determine where you want the current to flow. You can either determine the current to be flowing from this standpoint to here. We we'll call this a clockwise current. Or you could go the other way around. You could say that the current is flowing this way. It doesn't matter how you do it, right? You just have to just pay attention to a few things and we'll, look, we'll discuss it eventually. Then this would have been the first loop. Just talking a little bit about the circuit and a whole. Then um, this one is also another loop. So we're going to call this loop B. Similarly, in loop B, you will also think about where you want your current to flow in that particular loop. So by way of putting the arrows inside of this um, circuit it shows us where the current is going to flow so my current is going to flow like this all the way through here going all the way up and coming back around if we look at point p point p is referred to as a junction right 
So if our current is flowing from the EMF, generally speaking, they say current flow from the positive terminal to the negative. When the current is flowing, it is going to come to this junction. Remember now that when you're talking about parallel circuits, that the current is divided. So whatsoever current is coming from the EMF, that is going to be divided in the different junctions, right? So just bear that in mind. Now, as in regards to, let's look at what this is saying here. It says that when analyzing a circuit such as this one below here, the usual goal is for us to predict the current in the components and the potential difference across um, each, each component. So quite often that is the aim for us to find the voltage or to find the current flowing through it okay and one powerful equation that we will will use is ohm's law equation that says v is equal to ir quite often we can also ask it to find the power that is um, dissipated by each electron not electron my bad by each um, resistor or each component now, as it regards to Kirchhoff's first law, this is what Kirchhoff's first law states. It states that at any junction in a circuit, the current in the junction, or in other words, we can say the current entering the junction, must be equal to the current out of the junction. And we will look at these examples in a few few seconds. Now, because current speaks to the rate of flow of charge, then it, it boils back now to say that whatsoever charge that is going into the junction must be uh, the sum of the current leaving the junction. Okay? Now, if an event happens where the current does not, um, the current out of the junction is not equal to the current into the junction, then we would generally say that the charges have, have, uh, would basically accumulate at the junction, right? And that could be merely because of some issues regarding the, the circuits and so forth. Right, but that shouldn't really happen. So here's a general formula that states that Kirchhoff law tells us. So this is the current I that is going into the junction. That current that is going into the junction must be equal to the current going out of the junction. And this is making this is being referenced to, to this particular diagram. So here we have current going into a junction then the currents that are going out of the junction, which is because the arrows are going out, for the, out, of, out of the junction, the sum of those must be equal to the sum of the current entering the junction. So if we look at this example, we can identify which is going in, so we can write in and we can write out. So based on this, I1 is going into plus I2 uh, well, not I2, plus I5, I should say, I5, then plus I4, yes, plus I4, I4, good. Now, all of this are all of these currents are the currents that are going into the junction mind you know let's look at the current that is going out of the junction we're seeing i2 going out plus i3 and i think that covers it now you might be wondering why do we have this right the reason why they have that is because obviously current going in is equal to current going out. 
So if I were to balance the equation, sorry about that. If I were to balance the equation, meaning if I were to take um, I... Yeah, let's see, let's see. All right. Let's see if we're getting this correct. Because I don't understand how this looks. So. But um, let's check it again. Cur the, the currents that are going into the junction was I1, I5, and I4. Those that are going out are such. All right. Mm hmm yeah let's look at it like this now because these two things are equal they therefore tells us we can bring certain things across the equal sign to make life a little bit easier for us we can just bring these numbers across the equal sign so if we have i1 plus i5 plus i4 and we're taking those things across the equal sign. Um, then it would be minus I2 minus I3 is equal to zero. You know, this doesn't um, clearly gives us the same thing here. I'm not sure why. But let's not focus on this. This is really what we're supposed to have. All right? Because we knew, we, we saw a while ago that the, these currents are going into the junction. All right? And then, it's most, and then we'll look at the current that are going out. So it should really give you something close to this. Okay. Similarly, on the other end, we see where um, all of these currents are going into the junction. So we just add, add up all of these currents. So there's no current that is going out, right? Everything is going into. So current out is basically equal to zero. Okay. Now we can we can even look at it from another standpoint. We can just try to calculate certain things. So if, if we want to find I, I would have been equal to um, two amps plus one amp. And that, that tells us that I is equal to 3. And it makes sense. So whatsoever current that is going into must be equal to the sum of the current going out. So we expect that I would have been a much higher value. We can also, you could also try these for yourselves to, to determine what I is equal to. So just identify where the arrow is pointing. Is, going, is it going in? Is it going out? That will help you to determine um, whether, what, what the, the I value is. Now, Kirchhoff's second law, that law it is a little bit more complex. Well, what, what, what we're going to use, that user formula is going to be a little bit more complex, but um, it's, it's an easy, 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 easy law that states that in a closed loop, in any closed loop of, of a circuit, the sum of the EMFs, when we talk about EMFs, we're talking about the batteries, right, or the cell that, that, that provides the, the potential difference right um there we're saying though that at any in any closed loop of a circuit the sum of the emf must be equal to the potential drop across the components we have been looking at kirchhoff's law so when we looked at um the potential divider formula when, when we said that vt is equal to v1 plus um plus v2 this this essentially basically was talking about kirchhoff's law all along you follow me right so you have been using kirchhoff's law and you didn't even realize but we're going to utilize it more in this case all right so it says now that kirchhoff's law um follows the principle of conservation of energy so what it tells us because the emf is the this power source right it tells us that whatsoever energy that the power source has it's going to give that it's going to split up that energy across each components 
all right so each component when we add up those voltages it should add up back to what the power source started out with now here's just a simple circuit to show you what we talked about loop a while ago so in this loop i decide to make my current flow clockwise all right Let's see if we can put it to practice in terms of Kirchhoff's um, laws. Whenever you get a Kirchhoff question, right, it's important that you write down the laws. No, so here's the first law, right? So the first law states, we want to say K Kirchhoff's first law, just for short. I guess that can that can work for short. Right, so it states now that the current I is equal to I1 plus I2. Simple, simple, simple stuff. Current entering is equal to current leaving. Follow me? But in this event, let's just use what the question says. So the question says that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3 because I1 is going into the junction. So based on where the current, based on where you allow your current to flow, we allow our current to flow like this. So I1 would meet this junction. Then it, when it meets this junction, it's now going, going to divide itself. So that's our Kirchhoff's first law. Now, when you're looking at Kirchhoff's second law, you have to look at the loops that are in this equation in this circuit there are two loops which means that you're gonna have two Kirchhoff's um, law equation basically so for for loop a so loop a is enclosed by um, the, this EMF e1 and it is um, in series with r1 right and it is in series with r2 as well so we would start off by saying Kirchhoff's Kirchhoff's second law, right? And his second law would have stated to us that um, the sum of the EMF is equal to the sum of the I times R, which is basically the sum of the potential difference across the components. So that's just what it's his last states. Follow me? So in this event, what is the EMF? The EMF is going to be 12. And that's the only EMF on that side of the equation. So we say 12 volts, and they we're talking about loop A, by the way. 12 volts is equal to... Now, let's look at the... The, the potential difference that we have here. We have R1 and we have R2. Those two resistors are going to have a different voltage. So, in terms of IR, the voltage across the first resistor, R1, is going to be, the current flowing through R1 is I1. So, it therefore means we're going to say I1 times R1 plus when you look at the next resistor we're seeing that i2 is the current that is flowing through it so we say i2 times r2 it's important to note that that i2 is flowing in the same direction as i as how we perceive that the current is actually flowing once that's the case, then we, we the, the, the current, we don't have to change anything about the current. You will see that in another example. So this is for loop A. This is the equation. Well, well let, let, we, can, we can rewrite that a little bit by putting in the values for R1. So because R1 is um, 6, we can say 6I1 plus 4I2. All of this is equal to 
12 volts. So that's loop A equation. Now for loop B, essentially you have to do this for all the loops for the most part. So once you have identified that there are two loops, then you go right ahead and find out what is happening. So in this loop as well, I am saying that my current is flowing clockwise. Now, be careful now, guys. So let's look at the EMF. The EMF that we have right here is E2. It has a value of minus 3 volts. So minus 3 volts is equal to the sum of the potential difference across the components. Let's start off with this resistor, right, in terms of its voltage. The voltage is going to be I3 times R2, R3 rather, R3. Then, because of how my current is flowing based on what I said in terms of the loop, can you see that based on how I said it, that the current would flow up like this in, R, in R, R2? So R2, the current flowing is in an opposite direction to what is actually flowing through R2. So the current that is flowing through R2 is I2, right? But because I chose a path for my current to flow already, which is clockwise, I realized that both currents are clashing against each other. In order for me to um, make things work for me, I have to put a minus sign to show that the current I2 is flowing in the opposite direction. So I2 times R2, that current is flowing in the opposite direction from what the loop actually has set out. Remember the loop has set out a clockwise current. So by the time the current reaches here, right, we then realize that I2 is flowing down. So it therefore tells us that I2 is going to be a negative voltage, right? So having said this, we have the two loops that, that, that we will use. Well, I just need to just put in the values for R3. So R3 is 2. So 2I3 minus um, 4I2. All of this is equal to minus 3I. The aim of doing all of these questions, guys, is to find the currents, the currents that are flowing in, in the circuit. And it's going to require some mathematics, right? It's going to require a lot of substitution as well. One other thing you want to do, you want to kind of like either use an elimination method of, of working things out. I could eliminate, so here's one equation. So this is equation one. This is equation two. Essentially, I can use some type of method Either some method of elimination. But before I do that, I need to ensure that all the variables are, you know, how can I say it? That they are somewhat um, unique, right? Meaning that both equations have the same variables. So I could, but well, let me see what I have written down, written down here pertaining to this question. Yes, so the thing that we're going to do is we're going to sub I1 from this equation, right? So remember that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. Having said all of this, we can sub I1 into equation 1. So sub I1 into equation 
one. When I do sub that, I don't mind this thing here. So if I have 12V uh, is equal to six times I2 plus I3 close bracket plus four I2, all right? That is what I would have now. Then I could expand this thing, right? So 6i2 plus 6i3 plus 4i2. We could group some stuff. We could group the i2s. So we'll have 10i2 plus 6i3. All of this is equal to 12. So we kind of have a new equation. We're going to call this equation three now having said that i've been having having equation three if if i go ahead let me check this thing properly just to be sure that we have the same thing Yes. If I were to multiply multiply equation two by by three. I would get an equation that says minus 9v, right, is equal to 2, well, not 2, but 6i3 minus 12i2. I could rearrange it to say minus 12i2 plus 6i3. All of this is equal to minus 9 volts. So we essentially have two equations, right? And what you would observe is that I can, because I have 6i3 in both equations, I can then use the method of elimination. So I would subtract those two equations. So let's go on this page. So here are the two equations now. We have 12 equal to... 10i2 plus 6i3. Then we have minus 9 equal to uh, minus 12i2 plus 6i3. We're subtracting. So we're subtracting, we're subtracting everything. So 12 minus minus 9 is equal to 10i2. 3 minus minus 12 well my uh, so let me say it again 10 i2 minus minus 12 i2 um plus 6 i3 minus 6 i3 clearly the 6 i3s cancels out leaving us now with these two things we can factor out the i2 well not really factor it out which we can just go ahead and add them. Yeah. We can just go ahead and add them. But either way, it would end up being the same thing. So it would be 20, 22. Because we know minus and minus gives you plus. Right? And this is equal to. Um, so 12 plus 9, that's 21. So essentially, I2 is equal to 21 divided by 22 amperes. So that's I2. We want to find I1, I2, and I3. Know that we know I, I2. We can 
use another equation and the equation is going to be equation 3 if I if I'm correct let me just check right here so we're going to use this equation this loop this one right here because we can then easily find what what I I3 is going to equal to so if I use equation 2 using equation right if I use those, that equation equation 2 equation 2 is essentially 3v is equal to minus 4 i3 well not i3 i2 rather i2 plus 2 i3 we're solving for i3 so we can go ahead and substitute what i2 is i2 is 12 not 12 21 upon 22 that is multiplied by negative 4 plus 2 i i3 all of this is equal to um, negative 3 volts when we do the maths here so we get we get that i3 and you, you guys would have to check this i3 is going to be some value um, 9 divided by um, 20, 20, 22 amps so, so seeing that we know I1, I2 and I3 then I1 is nothing more than I2 plus I3 and this is coming from Kirchhoff's first law so we can then go ahead and and find what it is what i2 is going to equal to so not i2 i1 rather so that's 21 divided by 22 plus 9 divided by 20 not do yeah plus 9 divided by 22 uh so i1 is going to equal to um i believe 30 over 22 amps all right yes so that 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 takes care of that particular question no i want you to try this one because this one would more appeal to you right now but when you look at this question around here this one now involves an internal resistance so when you were adding up when you if we were to take this loop right loop a the the resist the, the voltage that we will have is r a plus the voltage across this small r right but we'll, uh just try see if we can try this question and try this one as well let me see if there's another one there's another one here which is this also attempt this one as well to see if you can actually practice on your own using the fact that there's an internal resistor here so because there's an internal resistor in the circuit you have to treat it like any normal um resistor Right, so there's going to be current flowing through it. If current is flowing through it, then it's going to have a voltage for itself, right? And I believe that would complete um, this aspect of the Kirchhoff's law.